I'm going to call this June 20th meeting of the Montpelier DRB to order. Um, tonight, introducing the members present, uh, starting on my right, we have... Hi, Abby White. Mike Miller, staff. I'm Rob Goodwin, chair of the DRB. Sharon Allen. And on our Zoom platform, we have Michael Lazorczyk. Hello, everyone. Thank you. And uh, we have Gene Leon. Hello, everyone. And then uh, we are waiting on uh, Joe Kiernan and uh, Catherine Burgess. Um, but as we wait for them, we will turn it over to Meredith to just give a update on our remote meeting procedures and processes and let you have any questions about that. Okay. So I am going to share my screen. Give me just a second with all the other stuff I've been doing. I don't have things as organized as usual. All right. This is partly for um, people who are also watching via Orca Media. All right, can everybody see that PowerPoint? Okay, so um, for anyone who is viewing this meeting via Orca Media, you can participate in tonight's Development Review Board meeting via the Zoom platform. You can use the link shown here on your screen. Just type that into your web browser, or you can call into this phone number and plug in this meeting ID. If you're having any issues um, getting logging in, you can email me here at mcrandall at montpelier-vt.org. I'll be monitoring my email throughout the meeting. Um, for those attending via Zoom, turning your video on is optional. For everyone attending, please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This is going to reduce background noise. Um, hold on one second. Somebody's trying to come in. Um, and it doesn't look like anybody's on via phone tonight, so that's helpful. Um, Please note that the Zoom chat function should really be used only for troubleshooting, technology or logistics questions. Um, if you have a question or comment about tonight's application, we ask that you raise your hand either physically when we can see you on the video or by using the raise hand button on your toolbar. Um, if you're having problems finding either of those and we're in a sex time where we are taking public comment at that time and we had a quiet space, feel free to just state your name and ask for permission to speak. Um, otherwise, you know, once you've raised your hand, we're going to ask that you wait for the chair to recognize you. I'll be helping to monitor that um, for the online. And Mike Miller, who is staffing in person in council chambers, will help monitor for those who are attending the meeting in person. Um, we do ask that once the chair has recognized someone to speak, especially for the first time, to make sure to provide your full name and your address. Um, tonight's, you know, this is going to help with our meeting minutes and just keeping track of who has raised comments and questions in case we need to get back to them. Um, there, depending on how many people we ultimately have for comments on tonight's application, um, when we hit that public comment period, the chair may try and put an initial time limit on initial comments just so that we can make sure everybody has a chance to speak, but um, the chair can grant additional time for speakers who have follow-up questions or comments. In the event um, that we're, we're having problems getting people in, because this is a um, sketch plan application, and I'll describe that later, um, we'll just try and collect those comments via email if I need to, um, but uh, otherwise we will keep moving forward. I'm going to now hand this meeting back over to the chair. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Meredith. Um, the next uh, item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. So I would accept a motion to approve the agenda with um, one amendment. Um, we have to elect an acting chair for this evening's meeting. Um, I will discuss more, but I will be recusing myself from uh, the application on um, Isabel Circle. And um, so 
with that amendment, I will accept a motion to approve the agenda. And a second by Sharon. Um, if people could make sure to speak really clearly oh. into the microphones, because I didn't hear first. who I didn't hear who made the motion. There's no motion, so we need a we need a motion. So I'm gonna make the motion. Agenda. Motion. Motion by Abby. Second. A second by Jean. Um, so all those in favor, Abby, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Sharon, how do you vote? Yes. Michael? Yes. Gene? Yes. And Rob, myself votes yes. We have an agenda for tonight's meeting. Um, so. Uh, we are moving on to, after a few brief comments for myself, as I said, I will um, um, be recusing myself this evening from the um, uh, sketch plan application. I'm a, an employee of uh, VHB who is providing the permitting services uh, for the applicant. Um, and so I feel like it's only appropriate for me to do so. And, um, you know, in lieu of that, as discussed, we'll be holding a election for a temporary chair that um, will uh, carry out this rest of this proceeding. And um, love to hear this application. I think it's a very great project, but, um, you know, only it's only appropriate. And um, so with that, I will move on to the approval of the meeting minutes, which I think we can at least do one of these with the people we have. Does anyone have a second eye on this? Um, we can do the May 16th minutes because Michael, myself, and Jean and Abby are all here. Um, and so do we have a motion to approve the or amendments or comments on the May 16th DRB minutes? Motion to approve. Uh, motion by Jean. Second. Second by Abby. Um, Abby, how do you vote? Jean? Yes. Michael? Yes. Self Rob votes yes. The minutes are approved for May 16th. Um, Meredith or Mike? For April 4th, I think we've already been here before and had trouble getting votes for this. What, what are our options here? Can we approve this or no? Um, so I've I've seen case law that says you can. Yeah. So I, I think we can do it. Okay. So I would now accept a motion to approve the April 4th uh, meeting minutes. Motion to approve. Motion by Jean. Second. Second by Abby. And Abby, how do you vote? Yes. And Jean? Yes. Michael? Yes. Sharon? Yes. Rob, myself votes yes. Um, April 4th minutes are approved. Okay. Wish. Um, this moves us on to our next item on the agenda is uh, I will accept a nominations for a acting chair for this evening's meeting, um, given that I will be um, departing the chair seat momentarily. Make a motion that Abby be the acting chair for this evening. We have a motion by Sharon for Abby to be the acting chair. Do we have a second? A second. And a second by Jean. Um, and um, so, Abby, how do you vote? Yeah. Sharon? Yes. Um, Michael? Yes. Jean? Yes. Uh, and I will abstain from that vote, um, which I believe gives us four votes. We still have four votes there. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, so, Abby will be our chair for this evening's uh, meeting. You all are in good hands. <laughs> all Thank right. You, Rob. Thanks, Rob. So moving on, so we're we're here for a sketch plan review of um, the project at Zero Isabel Circle. And so really the, tonight is just the opportunity for the applicant 
to um, share with us their their plans for this development, uh, for them to hear from the board and also to hear from members of the community. So we'll take time to hear from folks who are interested in speaking. Uh, we just ask that you you know limit your your comments to a couple minutes or less. Just be mindful of the time. And also, as you know, if you if you hear a comment that's already been made, um, no need to restate it. You can just say that you support it. And we just ask that if you're going to make it, uh, comments that that they're in addition to what's already been stated. So I'll um, I'll just kind of end with that. There's not going to be any um, formal vote tonight. Again, it's just an opportunity to hear and to discuss together. Um, and, and I think that's it. So Meredith, I think what I'll do is I'll start off and just ask you to provide an introduction to the application. Um, then we'll turn it over to the applicants to do their presentation. We'll open it up for, for board question and dialogue. And then finally, we'll open it up for, um, for questions from the public. Sound good? Thanks, okay. Patty. Great. So Meredith, I'll turn it over to you to walk us through just highlighting some of the key issues. We'll do. Um, because it's a it's a long staff report. If anybody who's there in person didn't get it, there were a couple of copies of the staff report on the table by the sign-in sheet. Um and uh if afterwards anybody who's on remotely wants a copy, it's linked in the agenda on the website. Feel free to email me and I can give you the direct link. Um and Abby sort of stole my thunder a little bit. <laughs> uh, it is a sketch plan review of a subdivision and planned unit development. Um, and the the way we do things here in Montpelier is you have a sketch plan review, which is just an ability to have an informal discussion about a basic application um, before the board can make any kind of decision on the application. Mm -hmm the applicant is going to need to file a completely separate application that we call the final application that will have a great deal more detail in it. Um, and that will fill in all those areas in red in my staff report that say, we need more information on X, Y, and Z. Um, so right now, informal discussion, but this is a really good time to get your questions, comments out so that the applicant can address them before we get to final. Um, both from board and from the public. So um, this sketch plan review is a proposal to subdivide a 72 acre parcel off of Isabel Circle into um, at least two parcels that will contain um, a little about eight and a half acres of land used for a cottage cluster planned unit development. So that lets the um, proposal have smaller buildings closer in proximity than you would normally do under regular zoning um, standards. Then there'll also be an additional 16 individual parcels. Um, um, each of those parcels um, able to have at least one single family unit, um, one single family dwelling. And then one of the parcels is actually large enough so it could conceivably hold four dwelling units. Um, there's also a sort of remainder of 55 plus or minus acres that contain the stormwater management areas and some just what I've been referring to as remainder land um, and exactly where those parcel lines will be to divide those sections is a little bit in flux. There's some discussion about that in the staff report. Um, so one sort of big disclaimer, and this is for everybody, this is for the board members, this is for members of the public, um, that even though it's mentioned a couple times in the application, discussion about what's happening with that remainder land and potential, um, especially potential conserving it or um, transferring that to become part of a park, those things are outside of the zoning purview. It's not actually part of the proposal that future, whatever's happening to that land. Um, and the board cannot condition what's being applied for here on what's done with those 55 acres. Um, 
right now. That's just not, it's not part of any of the trigger points in the regulations that have been, that are going to apply to the subdivision and PUD application. So we really just don't want to talk about that. Um, you know, those can be discussions among the public outside of here or between the public and applicants if that opportunity arises, but it's not something that the board can consider or talk about. Um, that gets into sort of an unconstitutional area that we don't want to touch. Um, and then finally, there are some things in the staff report that aren't the normal, just the applicant needs to answer these questions or fill in items before the final application. These are things that I really recommend that the board try and discuss or at least think about tonight and have a little bit of, of discussion with the applicant. Um, on pages 12 through 15 of the staff report, there's an overview of the planned unit development criteria. This is the very first time the board, the city has actually applied these criteria because this is the first time we've had a PUD since these regulations were adopted um, and four years ago. And there's some terminology in there that isn't really well defined. Um, you'll see that, like I said, pages 12 through 15, stuff about um, which direction the front entrance of a cottage faces, whether or not there's a view from the porch, whether or not a, the, the cottage is a but a common area. Those are things that I think the board should maybe discuss a little bit tonight. Um, I've specifically highlighted in that section cottages that I think might be problematic. So you can zoom in on that and see where you are falling on that. And then the other one is um, in the subdivision streets requirements, there is a bit of a conflict between what that section, and this is on page 23 of the staff report, what that section requires for sidewalks as compared to what our DPW, Department of Public Works standards um, are for when we require sidewalks. So there's an, a conflict there um, that we're gonna need to figure out how to deal with. So those are the two big areas I suggest that we definitely talk about, but any other questions anybody has, of course, you can go ahead with. All right, that's it, sorry it was long. Okay, thank you, Meredith. Any uh, questions from the board to clarify for Meredith? Okay, thank you. So now we'll hear from the applicant. So welcome. Hi, thank you. Is this working? Yeah. So I appreciate the opportunity to get some initial feedback on the concept. I'm Gabriel Lajanas. I'm the sponsor of this. Uh, and myself and some investors have been looking for opportunities to, to work on the housing crisis that we have in Montpelier. Uh, you know, going back a couple of years in conversations with city staff to try to understand those areas uh, some of these are outlined in, in the master plan, and, and certainly many of them are outlined in our zoning regulations. Uh, many conversations with landowners trying to identify a good, uh, good opportunity, and this land presents a, a unique opportunity probably once in a lifetime to uh, you know, really accomplish a number of things, including uh, the housing, um, which, which is a primary goal, but also uh, some some other, which we won't get into all the details, obviously, but preservation and other things that are important to um, to the community. So the the, the basic overview is, uh, and Jeff Zwaber from VHB will go through this in, in detail and we'll answer questions, but just the basic uh, rundown is 38 cottage clusters. The idea of a cottage cluster is uh, homes that are, you know, that cars are sort of in the periphery, they're off to the side, um, front, uh, the, the front of a house faces common green space. Uh, you have greater density. It just creates a better sense of community. And we can look all, all across the country where these have been done and they're really beautiful neighborhoods. So it's the first that will be done under the cottage cluster uh, provisions in our zoning. 38 cottages, uh, you know, from one bedroom to three bedroom, 800 to 1400 square feet. And, uh, and then some lots that would be created around that um, 15 lots and then another lot that's actually set aside. We were having some initial discussions with Downstreet about some things that we might be able to do together there. So to be determined, but that's the basic idea is to create a really walkable, beautiful space uh, where we can take a little bit of a bite. You know, I, I would say, you know, we talk about the ecosystem of housing, you know, and the domino effect. You know, if you're looking at, we're really targeting the missing middle. These are people who are 
you know, maybe first time home buyers or they're trying to downsize. We know it isn't meeting all of the housing need, but the people that are currently renting, right, they will, they will move out and they'll provide some rental space that people don't currently have access to. And also people that may be in larger homes that don't need those or don't want those that may want to have a smaller footprint. It just provides, it's not the solution for all of what we need. We know that, but it's a, it's a first, uh, first bite to try to get some development that hasn't been done in a very long time. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff to go through the details. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for giving us the opportunity to present this project tonight. Um, I think it's an exciting project and um, I appreciate Meredith's very detailed staff report. Um, I think there's a lot of elements in there um, that will eventually um, work and, and get the information, make the calculations and provide. Um, but I want to try to maybe kind of walk you guys through our thought process um, and, and outline how we um, laid this project out when Gabe came to us to integrate it into the community and integrate it into the natural um, surrounding environment. So in order to integrate it and make sure that the project uh, minimized the amount of footprint um, for, and provide the appropriate number of houses, what we used is, is there, as Meredith and Gabe mentioned, the cottage cluster development. And so the cottage cluster development, uh, this is kind of a screenshot of one of the areas to kind of zoom, zoom in on that. Um, and it shows, uh, in this case, nine Co uh, cottage homes around a single uh, green space. So it has, it shares the backyards kind of, and it has that shared sense of community uh, with sidewalks that um, go between them um, around a functional shared green, uh, which will function as these people's backyards, but more of a shared sense as opposed to each person having their individual backyard. Um, but they also have their individual identity and, and their individual homes, uh, you know, with their own four walls. So it kind of provides a mixture of kind of community and individuality. Uh, typically around a house, the, the parking's right at the house. In these cases, uh, the parking is a short walk away. So there's in this uh, cluster here, there's nine cottages and it's next to 18 parking spaces. Um, for the houses um so each house has two parking spaces that'll be assigned to them and then uh, where the two are there we understand that people have visitors and deliveries um so there's additional parking for visitors and deliveries um along the road and next to the the um cottage cluster parking area um and then there's the ability to park also along the road you know from time to time there'll be um um parties and things where there'd be more visitors um, and people can park along the road and only one side of the road has a, a um, curb on it. So it allows that wider um, sense of temporary use um, beyond the um, paved area and on the shoulder. And so by using the, the cottage cluster development, um, it allowed us to minimize the footprint of the project. And so that only 20 areas, 20 acres of the 71 acres of this tract of land um, are proposed to be disturbed by this um, project. And that includes all the areas associated with the roads, the sidewalks, the tre street trees, landscaping, um, houses, uh, stormwater management areas included in that 20 acres, uh, and then sewer and water mains that have to extend beyond the road. All, all that's within only a 20 acre footprint on the 71 acres of land. And then when we were laying this out, we also wanted to make sure that we provided access to recreation for the people of um, this project and also the, the adjacent neighborhood, um, Isabel Circle. And once it's built, right, it's going to become integrated into a single monolithic neighborhood. So the people that live on Isabel Circle and the surrounding streets will have the opportunity to walk over um, other people that are in this area of Montpelier that you utilize the um, area of land that's just south of the loop. Um, we'll be able to park there and walk in through the um the land that's owned currently by the um by the city of montpelier um and then on to the remainder portion of this project that won't be utilized um for for, for the um development of the built area um this section of road on the, the south side of the cluster um on the right side the north side of the road there's the cottage homes um and then on on the south side um it's undeveloped so um people can um, can park on, on the street should they want to um, access the trailheads to the remaining parcel of land. And then although we're using the 
the cottage cluster um, in the central um, portion of the project. When we were laying this out, we really wanted to make sure that we complemented the existing neighborhood density and make sure that we transitioned from that size and, and shape of the existing lots um, in a respectful and similar manner. So along the, um, the, the west side of the project, it's worth to note on all our plans, um, north is to the right, um, west is um, to, to, to the top of the sheet. So these six lots, um, all are all similar size and shape of the existing lots um, on Isabel Circle. So we wanted to make sure we made that nice um, gradual transition to a slightly denser um, and a different configuration um, when it comes to um, the residential lot configuration that the cottage cluster uses. And then, you know, it's, it's a large track of land, the 71 acres, which we're only used um, 20 acres of it. We wanted to um, figure out where, to, where it makes best to, to connect and the, the flatter sections of the land um, that are away from the wetlands and the streams um, and um, are located at the northwest corner. So um, we wanted to connect where the existing Isabel Circle um, project ended um, and then a makeshift turnaround was constructed over time. I guess it, I don't know if it's really constructed, but it's just um, dirt um, that over time from delivery of vehicles um, and people needing to turn around um, formulated a um, turnaround on, on this track of land. So it made sense um, that the most developable land was at the northwest corner. Um, and the makeshift turnaround is located there to, to extend the road from the end of Isabel Circle. Now, we I kind of talked how we integrated the project into the existing community. Um, we want to make sure that we integrated into the surrounding environment as well. Um, we're going to do that by making sure that we um, more than adequately address stormwater. And we're going to do that through seven um, treatment and attenuation standards. Um, six of them are formulated by the state. Uh, water quality channel protection, groundwater recharge, um, soil depth and quality, uh, overbank protection flow, and extreme flood prevention. Um, and then the seventh one is um, mandated by the zoning ordinance, and that is during the 25-year um, recurrence um, rainfall event to make sure that we're reducing the peak flows from that rate. So when we look at these seven treatment criteria. They cover from small storm events to large storm events to make sure that the, the runoff um, from this project uh, does not have any adverse effects on both things that are constructed downstream and, and natural things downstream. Um, one of the things we heard from the neighbors, um, Gabe reached out to them uh, early in the process and we had a neighborhood meeting um, to the north of this project uh, along Taplin Street. There's some exist, sounds like there's some existing homes that are struggling um, with runoff that's coming um, towards their property. And we wanna make sure that this project um, does not make that any worse. And we wa wanna make sure that to the extent that we can, that we um, can address anything that over time has shifted. Um, there's a power easement and things that are constructed uphill on Isabel Circle and, and make sure that adverse things have not been shifting drainage towards these properties. So. We're not quite at that point to do a detailed um, study on that. We have our surveyors on the schedule for later this summer to get out there, make sure they f um, do a field delineation of the topography and make sure we understand where exactly each of the, the, the rainfall drops are flowing. Um, right now, we feel we have a pretty good sense because uh, we're utilizing statewide LIDAR. Um, but, but you know, nothing's as good as taking the stuff that's remotely sensed um, from from airplanes and satellites and and making sure that we couple that with what our field surveyors and myself as well going reaching out to those neighbors uh, to make sure we understand how the rainfall is flowing. Uh, another one of the opportunities that this parcel provides is that um, there's municipal wastewater available. Um, it allows us to connect at the end of Isabel Circle to um, a wastewater main that was sized. Um, to, to extend that road at, at a certain time, you know, this time has now come um, so that we do not need to construct large leach fields, you know, other projects that and in Montpelier um, and statewide that don't have municipal sewer available, uh, large leach fields need to be um, constructed and, and encompasses cutting down trees or taking existing farmland um, and removing it from service uh, to, to provide waste on-site wastewater. So um, we feel fortunate that uh, municipal sewer um, is available um, and there's adequate treatment capacity. There's also um, adequate municipal water supply at the end of Isabel Circle. Um, this will provide both drinking water and um, fire protection flows um, for, for the project. Um, and then 
this project can be constructed without any wetland or stream impacts. There's wetlands and streams. Um, VHB did a, a field delineation of the, the wetlands and streams, and they're prevalent more on the eastern and, and um, southern portions of the tract of land. And, and up at the um, northwestern corner, corner of this parcel um, at the higher elevations, um, there, there's, no, um, there's no wetlands or streams and, and their associated buffers that will be impacted. And, and we're constructing it on the flatter slopes of this parcel. Um, so the slopes range, we, again, we still need to get out there and do a field delineation, but it's very apparent that, you know, it's the flatter portion of it. And the, the slopes range from a very manageable, you know, five and 15% and slope. Um, and the way we laid out the loop street, it follows the grades so that um, the cottage cluster, we can all have that um, be ADA accessible and sidewalks can be less than 5%. So the, the cottage clusters develop um, ADA accessible, and then the single family lots um, work well around the, the perimeter of the project. Uh, and the ones on the um, the uh, east of the project, uh, you know, they're, they're gonna have the um, the configuration where they have the, the, um, uh, the, the front, the front level being at, you know, the first story and then like a basement walkout. Um, so it works well, like a 20% grade transitioning to, to the east side of the, um, the project. And then, um, you know, both from a long-term and a temporary perspective, we want to make sure that we have adequate erosion prevention and sediment control measures. Um, I'm sure you guys are no strangers to erosion prevention sediment control plans, but we're certainly do one for the entire project and making sure that we provide the sediment control um, and through the use of um, temporary sediment traps and silt fence and check dams, um, but also um, making sure that we prevent erosion should a larger storm event occur during construction. Uh, it'll um, have the project in a um, phased approach, um, very small, um, sequencing where small areas of the project will be um, exposed dirt at one time while it's under construction um, and also during a limited duration just to really reduce that risk should a large storm occur um, when the project's being constructed. Looking at our typical street section, um, there are some elements we met uh, last week with DPW and as far as specific elements like the, the road cross slope and the presence of sidewalk, uh, you know, DPW indicated that they don't even want sidewalk necessarily on, on a street that's as low volume as this. And, and we agree with them from a safety perspective. We don't necessarily need to have sidewalk. Um, we think it's a great amenity, especially when couple, coupled with the cottage homes. We generally try to put the sidewalk on the cottage home side of the um project so that it the sidewalk really kind of serves as a linking mechanism because there's already sidewalk that travels away from the right of way it kind of links those stubs of sidewalk together um we certainly think it's safe at this low volume of traffic to, to walk and bike um directly on the road um both on this isabel circle extension loop and the existing portion of the project um there's landscaping on both sides of the street and then a swale um, typically on one side of the street. So the stormwater um, can flow across that and be treated um, through both structural and non-structural treatment practices. It allows it to infiltrate in a more um, diffuse manner than the um, stormwater management areas that will construct um, such as a gravel wetland or bioretention that will both provide treatment and slow down the runoff from the peak storm events. Um, so, so that's kind of some of the thinking behind why we integrated and mixed it up between um, having a curb on the sidewalk side um, and then a swale on, on the ditch side. Uh, this is one of the drawings that we submitted um, during sketch plan and, and there's typically they're very similar. All four sections are very similar, but uh, it kind of vary between uh, which way the road's curving, which side the cottages are on and the single family homes. So which way it slopes and the, and the swales on and the curb. Um, there's one segment um, where the cottage homes are on both sides. So the sidewalks on both sides with the normal crown and the, the um, curbing. But I, I'd look forward to getting further input from um, the, the DRB and, and DPW. We, I think we have many of the key elements outlined, but we still, um, as Meredith um, kind of outlined in the staff report, we, we still won't need to work through on the specifics um, as far as of what the, the curbing and the cross sloping and the widths and everything. Um, but I, I think we're close. I pulled this slide deck together before um, Gabe and Meredith went. So I think they've probably more than adequately covered what, what we're looking for, for a built environment, the 38 cottages with the range of 
of um, sizes um, around six um, of those green spaces that I previously previewed, um, 76 parking spaces, 15 single family lots, um, and one lot that supports four dwelling units. Appreciate kind of that opportunity to just quickly outline. I know Meredith's staff reports in much more detail, but I thought it was kind of important to kind of go through on a high level to figure out, you know, how did we come up with, you know, the 70, um, what to do with 71 acres of land and how, how we laid this out. Um, so, so thanks for the opportunity to present how it fits into the surrounding community and the built environment. Great. All right. Thank you for that overview. So now let's turn it over to members of the board. I believe there's four of us here, including myself. Um, Meredith, did anybody join kind of during the presentation? Uh, we have Catherine. She's gotten on. Okay, great. So we've got five members of the board. So I'll just query the board. Um, questions. What questions do you have for the applicants? I had a question just about, and <clears throat> it sounds like a lot of the um, sort of final measurements for things are not done, like setbacks. And But in looking at the... Um, can you just talk through a little bit um, with the cottage cluster? That setback is supposed to look from the outside, like the neighborhood setback, right? So, yeah, my and I'd definitely like to get further input from you guys and Meredith, but my understanding how we read the, the zoning ordinance is that the single family lots um, and the quadplex, there's the codified front, side, rear setbacks. Right. For the cottage cluster, um, there's two parcels, um, one in the, the middle of the, the Loop Street and then the one um, on the right side of Loop Street, which is the north side. And those parcels, um, those setbacks around along the road, um, it, they're the same as a single family setback. So those the, the, there's no interior setbacks between. There's a lot of certainly a lot of dimensional requirements of where they need to be oriented, okay. but there isn't the the zoning um, ordinance of like a front side setback of cottage cluster. There's there's reference to like where the like a private garden area, like or a private lawn area should be located and where the green space should be located, but not not per se the the, the setbacks under the zoning ordinance for the cottage cluster. Okay. In, interior. I guess I understood to read that that the the perimeter of the cottage um, clusters would have the same setbacks that the residential neighborhood isn't that right it, which we did provide yeah yeah, yeah. okay and um yeah. and then i did notice that there didn't seem to be um any designation so for sort of there's a like a private yard designation in there yeah um so it's like we, 300 square feet per cottage right and and so on one of the drawings that we submitted i don't think i have it in the slide deck but we did show like on each of them there is like a 300 square foot like they don't want a cottage my interpretation of the intent and maybe it's wrong but um next to each of the the cottages um like there is the 300 square feet um between like the road and the the um the cottage that they can use for their personal usage right and then um, the green um area is more of the shared um, common area the, the shared common area okay thanks other questions. So I, I want to go back to um, the pages that Meredith had called out in her staff report. So there's a lot that's in this staff report. So my intent is not to go through every section and every um, highlighted area. If if board members have ones that they want to focus on, please speak up and let me know. But what I wanted to focus on together as a board is starting on page, starting on page 12. Um, and then the, the related to the, the PUD standards. And then kind of get some clarification or just kind of hear from the board on how how each of us is interpreting some of these new terms. So uh, for example, it the 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 guy the the regs require um for porch to offer a view of the common space. And in certain instances it it appears as if with certain of these um 
we can't quite see there, but if you if you were to zoom in, we might be able to see a yeah. little bit better yeah. of the um the image. Yeah, so you're gonna want to zoom in on cottage twenty two area. Yeah, that's I think we're looking we're getting close to it. Yep. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> so in this case, you know, it doesn't appear as if cottage twenty two has much of a view at all of the central green area from its porch. And and how are we viewing that? They they have a view of other green areas, but not kind of this common one. And I'm wondering if if the board has any views on that. I guess it's not the only location that that's true. Isn't 25 also in a similar situation? Yes, it it is. Okay. Yeah, their their deck or their porch is facing the the walkway. So I, I guess that's a question for for you all. You know, how are you how are you interpreting this this section of the regulations? So we tried to lay it out with working both with the topography. Like, there's just a certain limit of how you put the puzzle pieces together, um, and acknowledging that there's various levels of people that want to share in the same experience. We felt that you know each of the units would appeal to probably different types of people. Um, I definitely agree with you on 22. It, there isn't necessarily, um, from a strict sense, a view of the, you know, a very prime view of the um, the centralized green, um, but they kind of get different different views from different windows. Um, and I guess I definitely take direction from the board. And if, if they think that the views and the direct line of sites need to be adhered to more strictly, um, we can take another pass at it. Okay. What are the, what are other others on the board think of that? Can you um unzoom so that we can look at? I think that there it seems yeah. to me like there are several other houses that are sort of in that position. Yep, there there are a few. So maybe just maybe looking at all of those. So twenty two, which is why the end of that garage. Um, thirty one is kind of in a weird spot. You know, I mean it's a it's a corner. Any any corner lot here is going to have that same thing where. And then, honestly, the four units that are in the center there, 26, 25, 23, and 24, I mean, I guess they all look like they're oriented away from the greens. That's, it's, yes. You know, so, uh, you know, I mean, I guess uh, that's where it starts to look less like it, uh, in that section there, you know, when with 22 at the head and then those four units placed down there, it looks less like a cottage development than the rest of it, maybe. You know, it looks a little bit more sort of traditional neighborhood e. Yep. And that also relates to a, another um, specification that the principal entry to face is to face the open common space. So in that case, it's not just the the view, but it's the principal entry is oriented in the opposite direction. So I think I mean I I think that you know our our work here is to ensure that the the regulations are being upheld and I think there's a few instances in the design where that could be pushed harder okay. where in the cluster that that Sharon laid out here um, orienting the views towards the common green orienting the the principal entry towards that would be good. And then there's finally another um, stipulation that directly abuts the common the common areas. I that that may be a little tricky to to um, to figure out in terms of like how everything gets oriented with the topography as you said, but that might be another thing to look into. Um, Abby, just so you know, Catherine has her hand up. Oh, thank you, Catherine. Yeah, thanks, Abby. And um, I'll admit I, I'm traveling for work and got really delayed on the train. So my apologies, I missed much of the presentation, but you know, I'm happy to have happy to be here and to have reviewed all the materials. On this question, um, yeah, I also, when I was reviewing the plan in advance of this meeting, had yeah, some hesitance around understanding the orientation, especially for the um, lower left-hand cottage square. I think for the, the ones to the right, you know, you have that very 
clear orientation where the, the porch spaces are facing the common greens and then to the left. Um, yeah, there I was, you know, in interpreting this alongside the regulations where we're looking at whether the um, whether these common spaces are abutting the, the green space, there is definitely some questions for me there. Um, I also wanted to understand, and apologies if you covered this in the presentation, I don't think we had an image quite like this with the, um, the parking drop-off spaces, the twos here labeled so clearly. Um, I was curious as to, you know, you have, maybe this will be covered later or was covered, but the, the changes in the um, street frontage and, you know, there is a, whether that has any impact on the, the orientation or the treatment of the facades. Um, so as far as the, like the park, it goes from a 22 foot, um, section to a 30 foot section where the, the number twos are, um, I guess I'm not necessarily following the question as far as the effect of the treatment of the facades. Um, yeah, as I, you know, I'm, when I was reviewing the plans, I was curious as to how the drop-offs would be managed, you know, uh, visitors, groceries, et cetera. So this definitely answered that question for me, but then you see, you know, you have some of the, um, the cottages essentially directly face, um, you know, one of these, uh, the pull-ins or whatever the, whatever the term is for them. And um, yeah, you wonder, does that mean that they have a, uh, they don't necessarily then have a direct access point. Like if you look at 19 S for example, you know, uh, most likely the visitor or the groceries are going all the way around the entire house if they're using the um, designed walkways. So I was just curious, uh, yeah, whether what's the, the philosophy on that? So, so like on 19 S or I guess when I as let me look at um, like 30W, right? Um, and even 31W. Um, those cottages, there's the, the shared green, but then there's also, you know, in the traditional sense of, you know, a front porch and a street. Um, I don't think like 31W, it's necessarily more undesirable to face the street than to face a, and with an adequate front yard than to face the, um, the central green so so each of them kind of varies um and then like back to 19s um that one the parking would be um would be to the to the north over here so the the walkway is directly um past all of your neighbors um you know for 19s you, the parking um you'd pass um 18 16 17 and 18 to get to 19 so you're kind of sharing that integrated sense of community um and then there is a drop off area like right to the page bottom, which is the east um, where you, you'd, you'd go, you go around and um, that distance is no more um, than like the distance of 24S. So um, we, we tried to make sure that it integrated throughout um, with others. Um, and I acknowledge there is some trade offs and, you know, putting together the puzzle pieces, um, we felt like this kind of offered the best um, combination between um, street frontage and uh, because being, you know, having a house along a street is also desirable um, and not necessarily strictly um, having one fronting a green. Other questions? Oh, Meredith, go ahead. Um, so I'm just going to, throw something out here because it's about something the I think one reason this was designed this way it that goes to uh, uh, Catherine's comment so there is a requirement right that each cottage have a principal entryway that faces common open space that's not separated from that by a street or a driveway right so you have to and the whole design of this you have to have the parking off to the sides um and your, your principal entrance has to face that common open space. 
that doesn't mean and this also is something to maybe go back to Jeff and Gabe to talk about that your buildings can't have a secondary minor access entryway, right? Where the building isn't designed, it, it doesn't look like your main entrance to your building. So theoretically, you know, your 19 through 16 could have a back door here out of the yard with, you know, little not paved maybe entryways, but little stepping stone entryway, you know, entrances or something where people could come in through the back door. You don't, you don't, your building isn't restricted to having just one entrance. It just has to have that one principal entrance that is probably where the sidewalk would go, would be my guess. Um, just a thought. Are the units designed with doors on that side? Sorry. So oh. I, I think, and forgive me if we're, we're kind of stumbling a little bit on concise answers. Um, and your, your, your question is great. Like, you know, what exactly is the unit? And so as far as, and Meredith, correct me if I'm wrong, like this is like a sketch plan of the subdivision, right? We're looking at the overall layout of, of the items. And really, you know, we could come with just the um, subdivision in the lots. And I don't think that'd be beneficial for anybody, right? We want to kind of give you as much information as we can. And so I guess I'm, that's a long preamble to like, we're still early in the process yeah. as far as what the units specifically are and how they're how they're laid out. Mm -hmm. Right. But this having this discussion about how the building is oriented, where the principal entrances are, thoughts about access is all going to bleed into them building that bigger application. But agreed. They don't have to have the the house design set up yet. Right. Right. Well, I think your point, Meredith, about um, secondary access and, and whether that um, in certain instances, because of the topography, it may be very difficult to have every every view of 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 equal value to the, the green space and, and every entrance aligned in that same way. But looking at um, secondary entrances, you know, to do the best that you can to fulfill the intent of the regulations, I think is important. I think we can definitely make improvements there. Can, can I just ask a question about the view, Meredith, where, where that comes up? I'm just looking at the, so in the regs, it talks about the principal entryway. This is in um, 3404H, right? This is the principal entryway that faces the common open space and shouldn't be separated. But then right below it, it mentions uh, that a minimum 50% will abut and can't can't be any further than 60 feet long. So just as we're trying to lay these out, I, and the other thing too, I think just generally, you know, the units, the individual units will be, uh, we're going to pre-sell, we hope. And so what that actual unit is, I mean, th this is a footprint, yeah. a general footprint, right? Uh, but I think it would be useful as we go back to make sure that we're complying, you know, what, what does that mean? So we know we want to, we, we need to face, but the way that it's worded here in that, you know, subsection three, you could be 60 feet away. As long as you're facing that direction, you're still in compliance. Right. So there's those items. And then there's also separately having the view from your porch, which is earlier, right? Which is 3404G, uh, where is it? Um, five. It's about the porch, that your minimum porch size, and that within that porch, um, it has to have a minimum dimension of eight feet on any side that offers a view of a common open space. Um, oh, I guess it's any, so you know what? I may have misinterpreted this as I'm going through this my like fifth time, but on this application. So, the cottages have to have a roofed open porch at least 80 square feet in size with a minimum dimension of eight feet on any side that offers a view of the common open space. So the porches don't actually have to offer that view. But if they do offer that view, it has to have a minimum dimension of eight feet on the side that offers the view. Oh. Sorry, guys, my staff report has an error there. Uh, there's, but this is one of those, how that fits in with, like you said, your abutting and the having the principal entrance face the common open space. 
this is the very first time we've applied any of these. Mm -hmm. So getting your input on when things do not work is going to be important. Thank um, you for that clarification. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, and thank you for making me reread it again. So um, going back to board nope. question, Catherine, I see you have your hand up. Oh, yeah, thanks. Just before the conversation moves on, it's glad to hear that acknowledgement earlier that the circulation could use a little bit more work because I do think, especially with this additional clarification from Meredith around um, the philosophy, you know, the, uh, around the regs, um, you know, it's clear that the design philosophy here is that people are parking in the shared parking and walking by their neighbors and having, you know, that design contributes to the community feeling here. But I think it doesn't take away from the community feeling to have the secondary access points, like especially thinking about winter conditions and other situations where yeah, it's like the grannies and groceries point, like there will be situations where it's uh, people will create a way to get into the houses easier, more easily if there uh, isn't a uh, naturally designed circulation point. So. Thank you. Okay, so I, I wanna move on from this section unless there's other questions about it. I had I had a couple quick other questions, but. About this section? About non, no, not about this section. Okay, we'll, we'll do those. Okay, Sharon, go ahead. What were your um, other questions? I just wondered, and and maybe this is not an appropriate time, but um, when looking at the um, stormwater management um, steps that you were taking, are you um, factoring in uh, a conceivably pretty large parking lot with your four unit building and um, the private driveways that are coming uh, on board? I realize that that's sort of not your focus right now, but would that be part of the end game plan? Certainly. Um, yeah, we, we will make sure that the, the stormwater management will be built to accommodate any reasonable build out of the single family lots and in, including quadplex. Okay, I just didn't see that on there. Um, and then the um, emergency services has looked at this plan? Yes, during the technical review meeting um, last week. Okay. It seemed like it would be hard to get to some of them, the cottages. How are they yeah, going to get there? So th there are, um, and we still need to go through and look at the building codes that have been adopted and how far access points need to be. And um, we'll, we'll make sure that it meets all of the um, state standards as far as um, emergency access. And that's what that's what we require to do. And that's what um, emergency services has asked us to do. And then I just had one other just kind of passing question to set of curiosity was with the garage structures that you have, are those going to be open? What do you know? I'll just say, I think it's going to end up being a cost factor, what it's going to actually look like. I mean, uh -huh. um, we'll see. Prices and materials are coming down. We're trying to target the missing middle. And if you start factoring in a fully built out garage, it starts getting really expensive. So we'll, we're not there I just wondered. Yeah. Thanks, Sharon. I had a I had a couple other questions as well, and then I I do want to talk about the um the the new street requirement piece as well. Um, so I'm wondering, did you explore any commercial use in this in this development? Uh, in terms of like something that would be mixed use. Yeah. I didn't see any allowance for that. Uh, can you make sure you're at the microphone? Because those of us remote can't hear you, which means the I, minute taker can't. I, I didn't consider it. I mean, we're really looking for a housing project, but um, yeah. I didn't see an allowance for much commercial use in an R9. Okay. Unless, unless I'm wrong on that. Meredith, what do you know? I think he's right. Okay. Sorry, Abby, did you want me to take a peek at that? No, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, I think there there are things. I mean, I think there's childcare, there's things like that that you can do, but yeah. I didn't see a lot of other. And we weren't we were really looking for housing. You were looking for housing, yeah. okay. And I'm also wondering if you could talk about, um, you know, road access. So it it funnels through Isabel Circle. Did you explore other access points in, in the design? Yeah. So I'll just I'll just comment sort of on the 
the lar larger issue associated with other access points. And then Jeff may have some more technical things to comment on. You know, the original project that was proposed here, you know, back in 2007, 2008, um, it got all the way through Act 250. Uh, there, there was another access point down to the Barry Montpelier Road. It required about 215 units to be able to support that. I mean, it's a multi-million dollar road build, steep slopes, lots of disturbances. We, we didn't want to do anything like that. You know, there's a lot of people that uh, use this land. We want to preserve as much of it as possible. And so the focus was how do we minimize? How do we keep away from the steep slopes as much as possible? There could be some potential that, you know, to sort of hook up and around to where the existing condominiums are. Uh, be, I've talked to some of the people in that community, and I think that would be very unpopular. So, and it's also uh, not in the scope of what we're trying to accomplish. We're, we're, we're trying to you know, how do we do a, a substantial uh, development of housing, but you know, we're, we're also not trying to knock this all out of the park. There's a lot of other pros projects in Montpelier. If they all came together, we, we'd make a good dent in the housing. We're not trying to do everything. No, and we, we well, a little bit, I guess, about like looking at Herbert Road um, and the ability to connect there. It That's mm -hmm. the rights there are complicated. So we thought that it was not the best way to go there. Um, Isabel Circle, then to that was kind of the natural point where the it, it met up with the natural terrain, right? It, it's the most developable portion of it for housing. Um, it's Gabe was looking for a housing project, not a commercial project. So all like very quickly, like when we looked at where the streams and the wetlands and everything, we very quickly um, focused in on the Northwest corner of this property. Okay. Thanks for that additional information. Other other questions from the board? Okay, and I just want to now also um, turn to the second section that Meredith flagged for us. Thanks, Mike. Page twenty three. Okay. And just to acknowledge that um, that the side rock requirements um, conflict in many cases with the city's road typology components and uh, tiers is used by DPW. So uh, as we understand it, this is this is a matter for the planning department and, and DPW to take a look at and to coordinate recommendation, but I wanted to um, just give the board any opportunity to, to weigh in and, and share thoughts on, on that, that portion of this. I guess I, um, go ahead. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, I'd be interested in what exactly is going to be the determining factor for whether that's a private or a public road. So I think the intent of, so I think there's a couple of different, like when you look at private public, there's a couple of different aspects of it, whether it will be publicly accessible and open for people to walk across. And I believe that's the, that's the, gaze, intent. That's the intent. So it's going to certainly be like, so the general public can use the road to access um, the existing conservation recreation area. Then regarding whether it's a public or private road and the long-term maintenance of it, it's going to go down to whether it's constructed at DPW standards and the city council is willing to accept it as um, a, a as a public public road. Um, so we're hopeful that we can work through with, with DPW. I think this is, um, you know, it's a loop that, that, a lot, that properly terminates the end of Isabel Circle. It accesses existing con uh, the conservation recreation area. I think it's something that would be beneficial for the city's long-term use and, and ownership of it. Um, last week, we did have some discussion whether right, regarding the sidewalk, right? They don't, they don't necessarily want to come up here and plow the sidewalk. You know, it's more of an internal amenity to the cottage cluster home. Um, so I think at this point, we can kind of wade through the conflicting um, requirements we're getting from DPW and the zoning ordinance. Um, you know, the, the zoning ordinance kind of gives preference to, and it's not necessarily for a safety perspective, it's like just a nice amenity. Hey, we want we want two sides of sidewalk on all roads. Um, you know, from this level of traffic, like that's just not warranted. Um, you know, not even not necessarily on one side, but like on the cottage side, we could install a sidewalk and that could be um, either, we could maybe even push it back beyond the right of way or have it like um, in the right of way, but with a, a um, 
a, a private um, easement over it so that it's privately maintained by because you're gonna have to plow the sidewalk throughout the the cluster anyway so the the private maintenance of the sidewalk um and then there's also like shifting back now to like the two sides on it it talks about the overall density of the project and the cottage cluster is more dense than is it two two dwelling units per acre but not necessarily when you look at like the gross density of a 71 acre tract of land so i think at the, with the drb's discretion sidewalk on one side when considering the overall den gross density as opposed to like the density like right there um sidewalk on one side might be approvable so um long way of saying there's some conflicts conflicts in the nuances but i think we're pretty close to what everybody's looking for okay sharon did you have other i i did have another question on the separate on the separate section so i don't know where we are i don't have anything else on that one i just want to before we i want to see if there's any other thoughts from the board before we move on from this section here But I thought that the, the way that you described it, that that seems to make a lot of sense. You know, you look at the overall density of the of the entire parcel. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Sharon. Um, there was a brief mention in here of a homeowners association. Is that what the plan is for all that? That's a lot of internal plowing you got going on there. Well, yeah, I think in nowadays, even without a cut, I think there might, we'll leave it up to the attorneys, but um, nowadays, any project typically requires when you have stormwater and, and the ownership and maintenance and ongoing reporting that's required by the state, um, it will require a, a homeowners association for that maintenance, long-term maintenance and um, ownership. Um, there's single family lots that benefit from that um the and and the cottage cluster as well there's also many that are just associated with the cottage cluster um i think we're in early in the process as far as how we slice this for homeowners associations but before it's all said and done i'm sure there'll be one if not two um you know or, or at least yeah, I'll leave it on the game. until we get until we get some legal advice as we move forward it's hard to know exactly but because we have these wastewater uh, or stormwater, you know, retention. It's almost like everybody here needs to have a piece of that, which is sort of def different than the cottage clusters that, you know, need to take care of the green, need to take care of private parking, right? All those things. And so there probably are at least two, but again, until we get legal counsel and get a little further, we, we, you know, the whole point of this is to get some good feedback. So as we spend a lot of money on engineering, we're looking at the right things. So we really appreciate that, but okay. we definitely need to figure that out. Okay, great. So just looking at the time, I think we want to create some space now for questions from the community. And um, Meredith or Mike, do you have suggestions on, on how we do this? So usually what we do is we will start with the folks who are here in person uh, to give comments or ask questions. And then after they are completed, then we will go to uh, Meredith to help to organize the folks online. Okay, that sounds good. And so if anybody is is interested here in the audience in asking a question or, or saying a few words, um, just come up to the mic here and you'll have a couple couple minutes. Please do make sure to announce your name and your address, whether you're commenting there in person or commenting remotely. Thanks, Meredith. Hi, I'm Trish Eaton at 29 Hebert Road, which is uh, at the stage where Isabel Circle comes and sort of abuts my driveway. So if you're driving too fast up at Isabel, you go into my driveway instead of going up Hebert Road, <laughs> and which makes it quite interesting. Uh, we have an awful lot of traffic that goes through. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I happened to see our chief of police, uh, BD, a PD, and I asked him in regards to uh, the possibility of having a traffic counter uh, located at the just as you come down on Hebert Road. And I noticed the other day there was one. And uh, there's an awful lot of traffic that comes through. 
And in fact, some people seem to think that it's a their whole road. And I ended up going almost into the area by Tina's house. We're coming across. I was coming from the area uh, on Hebert Road past Berlin, coming from Berlin Street down. And you have to watch it coming down around the turn. Once already, I've found as I made the turn, there are three little ones unaccompanied by an adult. And one was trying to learn how to ride a bicycle in the middle of the street. So people have to slow down. And then as I continued on and uh, where the next corner is for the turn by Velvet's house, some guys coming up through and he's right in the middle of the road. I ended up almost taking out uh, by uh, Julian Anthony's house. I was on to the property across from their house and they have a little library type thing that's standing. I almost ended up in that because people come way too fast and just don't seem to care that there's other people that may be using it. And they, it's just crazy. And one thing that was mentioned uh, in regards to down at the further area down there, when the plow trucks come through and stuff, I mean, they have to leave all the snow down there. But what happens when you have your school bus that stops right at the top of Isabel Circle and Hebert Road? And then all the kids have to come up the street to catch the school bus in the morning. And then when they finish, they have to catch the Section 8 housing and then all the others. So it depends. We may end up having to need a second school bus if there's more kids that are going to be attending school. So my thought is it's just an awful lot of traffic. The street is not wide enough. And uh, I mean, I sometimes get to the stage where we have tractor trailers coming down through and heading down Isabel and uh, for them to turn around. It's one of those situations where, hey bud, use my driveway back straight up, Isabel Circle, straight into my driveway because you're not going to make the turn going on to Hebert Road. Use my driveway and then they can pull out and go up Hebert Road. But it's just the traffic is incredible. I don't know what the data was from the traffic control counter. I don't know what the response was on that but uh, we do have an awful lot of traffic coming up through. And I can imagine with more housing coming up, our roads aren't the greatest. Though the, They have improved. They have improved somewhat and stuff with repairs, but I'm telling you, we have our share of stuff that's going through. So that's my comment in regards to that, that yeah. Thank you. Well, something's got to take place because the roads are just going down through are too skinny and too snake like. And you never know what you're going to find around the corner. So you better have good brakes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you for the comments. Okay. Anybody else in the room? Yes. Come on up. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Paul Burns. Uh, I live at 18 Isabel Circle. Um, I appreciate developers being here. I appreciate the DRB uh, and the work that you do. I also want to say I am uh, strongly supportive of more housing being built in Montpelier. Um, I know that it's an important need. I, I very much support the idea of increased housing. And I think this particular project has a lot of merit. Um, and so I am I'm definitely not here to oppose this project. It is in my mind, all about the conditions that are placed on this project that could help to mitigate the potential adverse impacts on the folks who live there. You'll hear various different opinions, I'm sure, from all the folks on Isabel Circle, Hebert, and others about the project overall um, or what might be needed there. But I think that if the developers are willing to address a couple of areas that, that are not yet in the current proposal, that it would go a long way toward increasing the support for me, uh, but for others who are in on Isabel Circle or again in the surrounding neighborhoods. So I'll just, uh, there are two things, two chief concerns that I, I wanted to just raise here. One is the increased uh, traffic, certainly a substantial increase in traffic as it would 
essentially double the number of housing units that are currently on Isabel Circle. Uh, so I don't think there's any question that that would rise to the level of a substantial increase um, in traffic there. In particular, there is the kind of pinch point of where uh, Isabel leads into Hebert, which leads on to Berlin Street. Uh, and there's a sharp incline uh, on Hebert as it approaches Berlin. In the winter with icy conditions there, that can be a particularly hazardous spot. If you're not familiar with that area, the slope seems to me somewhat like Park Ave in front of Union Elementary School, where there isn't a stop sign at the top of that, I presume, because they want people to have uh, uh, you know, some, some motion uh, to be able to make that turn at the top. I've always wondered why there's no stop sign there, but I kind of presume that that's why it is. Well, you got to have a stop sign at the end of Hebert Road before you go out into Berlin. Um, and it is a challenge. It's not infrequent that we see cars that are coming back uh, because they couldn't make it all the way up that turn. A substantial increase in traffic there could create an, a more hazardous situation where that, that kind of situation is more likely to occur. Um, beyond that, I think the, um, the issue is one of um, uh, sidewalks as well, not for the development itself, uh, but for the people who already live in this area. Some years ago, when the road was narrowed, um, Hebert uh, in particular, uh, some sidewalks were built on one side of that for a certain distance, but not on the most hazardous part of Hebert. There's a sharp turn and, a, and an incline there. And for those who, who are pedestrians in there, a lot of people do walking, to lose the sidewalk on the most hazardous part of the road is already a risk uh, for the people who live there. A risk that would be exacerbated by having both more cars and more pedestrians. So uh, tra the, the idea of sidewalks, the question of whether sidewalks are needed or not needed in the development, I don't have any strong opinion about that. But if we're talking about actually protect, protecting pedestrians in the community that would be affected by this development, it is that point, uh, it seems to me, that is of far greater concern. It is already a concern. Um, and I, I know there are issues there. It's a challenging spot. There's a drop off on one side. There's a rock ledge on the other. Uh, but, but that's a serious issue for, and of course, we want to encourage more pedestrian traffic um, around. Uh, finally, just with respect to traffic and what could be done to mitigate uh, that uh, undeniably substantial increase in traffic, I know it was mentioned that the previous development had proposed go to going down to 302. I still think that another point of entry to this development makes an awful lot of sense. I don't know about the economics of it, but I, it would certainly be... Um, it would reduce a lot of the concerns that people have about the increased traffic that would come on Isabel Circle. Again, there's only 20 some homes on Isabel Circle now. We um, enjoy that, but recognize that some increase in traffic is not unreasonable, but this would be more than just some. I think it would be a, a very substantial increase there. Uh, so either going down to 302 or finding some other means of mitigating against that, I think would be helpful. And I, and I do have questions, and I assume that they will be addressed in the traffic study, but uh, there is a talk about not an undue um, adverse impact, and uh, no substantial increase in traffic is just one of the criteria that is how you define an undue um, uh, adverse effect. Uh, there, are, there is a lot of language there that it's not perfectly clear what it means. Uh, substantial increase in the neighborhood. I, I don't have the exact language in front of me uh, at this moment uh, or for other uses and so forth. I mean, again, I think some, I, I assume there'll be greater clarity on that uh, in the traffic study, but that's something that I'm looking for. And again, I can just say, we are concerned about that. The risks are an awful lot of children on Isabel Circle uh, already. So I'm sure I've taken up more than my time, but I appreciate uh, your willingness to listen because I'd love to see this happen, and I'd love to see most people in our neighborhood welcome it happily. And I think that that's possible with a bit more work. So thanks very much. Thanks so much. Anybody else in the room? Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Christopher Viersema. Um, I live at Four Isabel Circle. I'd like to thank the development team and the DRB for having us. Um, so I want to also remain 
open-minded and I truly understand that there's a great need for housing in Montpelier and the surrounding area, um, especially for folks at the low and middle income levels. Um, so just a few things. The majority of the neighbors got together on Isabel Circle and we presented Gabe and his team with our collective concerns. Concerns and number one was the road and the traffic. Um, so this is just one word, one road in, one road out in this current plan. 38 houses in the proposed cottage cluster, 16 housing lots sold separately. That's around 50 houses, two, possibly two cars each. That would be 108 new cars commuting at least twice a day to get in and out. Um, yeah, so this is a dead end road. And of course, all this traffic feeds onto Berlin Street. Um, these folks just mentioned low volume of traffic in the proposed neighborhood, so there's no need for sidewalks. Um, that, of course, comes at the significant at the cost. It comes at the at the cost of a significant change to the volume of traffic in the existing neighborhood. Um, so District Three often feels left out of the sustainability conversation, uh, the conversations around pedestrian friendly uh, development in Montpelier. Personally speaking, uh, my family and I, you know, we'd love to commute downtown via biking or walking. Um, but find Berlin Street greatly lacking uh, safe sidewalks and protected bike lanes and um, or those things that would encourage uh, safe pedestrian commuting for families with children. So, you know, obviously we want to keep in mind our local response to global climate change. And I'd love to see more opportunities in our neighborhood for, um, you know, us to get downtown without cars, to not be so dependent on cars um, locally and, you know, I just think that we should collectively explore housing and development in a smart and future oriented way um, instead of just creating new commuters driving 100 more cars in our past the existing neighborhood. So I think it's pretty, uh, you know, a kind of collective concern so far. So thank you. Thank you. Come on up. I'm Tina Muncy. I live at 27 Hebert Road, so also at the end of um, Isabel Circle. I want to thank the developers. They came to listen to the community, and I, I think they have listened, which is nice. I, I just also want to say that um, I'd like the city to support the development uh, that happens in Montpelier. We certainly would like more uh, housing to take place in for that support, we've several people have spoken about sidewalks, and there are now at the end of Isabel's Circle, sort of right in front of my house, uh, there's the possibility of 12 children getting on the bus in the morning. If we assume some of the people that move into this development might have children, that would add more. And I think the idea of the city supporting the development by putting a sidewalk at least on one side down Isabel Circle and around Hebert to where the sidewalk is now is an issue of safety. I know you said within the development, perhaps that isn't necessary, but I think if the city were to look at it, it might be necessary to support the development. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Oh, come on up. Uh, I think, um, what's your, what, what's your oh, name? Sorry. Uh, Heather Cipolla, uh, 24 Isabel, Thank um, you. down near the end. Um, uh, most of, um, my concerns have been addressed by my fellow neighbors. Um, I'm, I was really sorry to see that the traffic report wasn't, wasn't back yet. I think we're all flying a little bit blind and, and talking about assumptions and things, um, uh, uh, without that. And I look forward to having that. Um, I, uh, um, I'm probably not as concerned about the additional traffic. Some of my neighbors, although my children are grown, um, my dog is fat and lazy. She's not going to end up in the street. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out, uh, a few of uh, my neighbors have spoken about how Hebert was narrowed, that when they repaved Hebert um, 10, 15 years ago, I just want to say that the city really bears some responsibility for what it did there. When the city repaved that road, I don't know if they do this at other roads in Montpelier. Um, sometimes I think uh, 
uh, like one of my neighbors mentioned, we in uh, District 3 maybe have a little chip on our shoulders. I don't know of any other streets in Montpelier that in order to repave a failing street, the decision was made to significantly narrow a road without any sidewalks on it. So um, Hebert is an even greater concern to me than Isabel. Isabel is at least as wide as it always as has been, and it, and it allows a, a you know a fair amount of wiggle room. Hebert is flat out dangerous. It's been dangerous since I I walk a lot. I will not take that right. I come to the end of Isabel. I will not walk Hebert in the winter time. Once the um, piles of snow go up, um, it's my you know. I leave for work at the same time the school bus comes down. I'm always terrified. I'm going to hit that first curve at the same time as the school bus. There, There's no room um, at all. Once walking home from high school in a snowstorm, my son almost got hit by a plow on Hebert. Um, so I just want to, besides emphasizing the narrowness of Hebert and the dangers of it, I really want to lay that at the feet of the city. The city messed that up massively 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I always meant to holler about it, not that organized, never hollered about it. So um, uh, I think the city really, is, if this goes forward, the city needs to do something about Heber because it's it's a disaster. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from people in the room? Come on up, please. Hi. Hi, I'm Rachel Caribou and I live at 28 Isabel Circle. And like my neighbors have addressed some of my other concerns, like with another exit. Could you step a, Can little you a little closer to the mic? Thank you. But one of my big concerns is the wastewater, stormwater. Um, my lot gets all of that from the whole development that we have now. Um, so I am totally like flooded. I have ditches on all sides of my lot. I have like one on the left side of my driveway that goes down through. And then there's one that comes across from the uh, back of the houses on Isabel Circle. So that's two going down into the back. And then on the right side, there's the big culvert in the back, the box like they put in the road. And like in the spring, like I've got like a roaring brook where there's no brook in it overflows the, uh, you know, the ditches and it just, just roars and, you know, damages the property. And in the back of my lot, it'll be all sitting in water for quite some time until it can disperse. And it's that water that also goes down on Taplin Street, but it's not only Taplin Street, it gets hit, it's me. If there's any more water comes out of that lot, it's gonna flow to float away. So where is your wastewater going? from your development? Is it coming to that big culvert on my land? So what wastewater is gonna be um, in the municipal collection system? Um, so Jeff, you're gonna to need to talk into the microphone so everybody else can hear you too, sorry. And Yeah, um, wastewater is gonna go into the municipal collection system. And I think it might be some water. Um, let me, I'm not sure exactly where you live, but let me make sure, what is the address again? 28 in the bell circle. It's also like on that blind corner with that road going to now be a, you know, constant traffic going down through. So it'll be hard, harder for me to get in and out. Okay. But the storm runoff, where's that water going? Is it coming to that culvert that's on my land? We'll definitely need to look into it. And we're going to have a field survey of all of the existing culverts in the surrounding area. Um, so the, the the intent is not to change anything uh, regarding the runoff. Uh, this project is located where, where stormwater goes to the northeast and south of it. Um, and we're going to make sure at all those locations that the stormwater discharge um, improves. And so I, I guess I can't directly answer your question because I'm yeah, not You say you're not going to change it, but it's already bad. So because like I even get water coming off like Hebert Road, there's a culvert up at the top that's under the road. All the water for that area lands on my lot. Um, so just a reminder to direct comments and questions towards the board. Um, oh. And then, and you know, part of this is so that the applicant can get your concerns. And if 
you know, fold that into when they're doing their work moving forward. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely appreciate your comments and let me, let me t take it and um, it'll take some time here to, to come up with a solution and an adequate answer for you um, that I look forward to providing in the future. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. listening. Thanks very much. Okay. So I think we can turn to questions, comments from uh, Zoom. And okay. Meredith, can you help to to identify those for us? Yep. So I do know that there's a couple people have their hands up, but I also know that George Johnson got on at the very, very beginning and let me know he had a question. So I want to make sure George has an opportunity. Um, you're going to have to unmute. And I just want to remind. And I just want to remind folks that if your comment is the same as one you've heard, just you can state that very quickly. <laughs> And then if there's an additional point, um, please take, you know, no more than two minutes. So thanks, everybody. All right, George, go ahead. Oh, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Can you do that? Can you find your little mute button? Sure. There How you about go. Now? How about now? Awesome. Okay, good. I had a question, uh, sort of a technical question. I looked at the, the proposal online, and in Section 3502, it says, quote, moves Hebert Road and Isabel Circle to a different tier in the road typologies. I don't know what typologies means, but I assume it means the classic class of the road, like a class three road, a class four road. Is that uh, right? Not quite. So <clears throat> Mike would know a little bit more about this, Mike Miller, planning director, but the city did a complete streets study and organized all of the different types of streets within the city in a more of an internal typology where they, um, depending on the density of the population, the kinds of traffic it sees, um, how wide the road is, determining whether or not it um, has or needs yeah. sidewalks, either on one side or both sides or no sidewalks. And Mike, it looks like you just opened up your camera. I don't know if you want to talk about this a little bit more, um, if you could. Yes. So the the quick answer to this is um, in 2017, while the city council was adopting the zoning, so this is why there's, they're not well meshed between these two plans. So the zoning was in public hearing being adopted by city council, the planning and DPW were working on a complete streets plan. So what this complete streets plan was trying to do is to make sure that every street was walkable, bikeable and addressed cars. I mean, we, we've spent a hundred years addressing cars. So usually that's not the issue it's, but it's making sure that all of our road systems work for all of the users. And so what the way we did this was to divide the every, we created seven street types. And type seven is the smallest street, which would only have just the road. And it was assumed that because it's low traffic, you could bike and walk safely on the street. And then as you move yourself up through the ranks, you get a sidewalk on one side, sidewalk on both sides. Um, and then you start having bike lanes. Um, and, and so as you get all the way up to a, the type one street, which would be, you know, Main Street, um, downtown and Berry Street mm -hmm. places. So the street types, are, that's what the street types are looking at. Now, it was a first draft that kind of went through. So Isabel Circle and, and Hebert are both classed as a type seven street. So it does not, um, under that typology, say that there should be sidewalks. Now, we didn't get to spend a detailed time on every single street, um, but this project has kind of given us um, an opportunity at DPW and the planning department and working with the developers to go through and say, um, to look at, will the additional traffic move them, move you, move the streets? If this is developed, will it move it from a seven to a six? And if it moves it to a six, then there's a sidewalk requirement. And if there's okay. a sidewalk requirement, then we have to make a decision at the street, uh, at the, at the municipal level, you know, how do we get that accomplished? Um, and, and I can't speak to whether that would be, you know, in, in other parts of the country, they would tag that on the developer um, in uh, Vermont. It's a little less so because it's so expensive to build. So mm. maybe part of our municipal um, part of this to go through and say, maybe we need to have this 
but we won't know that till we have the traffic report. And so that's why there's a little bit of question here about the street types right. is whether we're going to be shifting from that type seven, which says no sidewalk is necessary to being a type six, which says it is necessary. And, and there's no clear hundred percent line. Um, but, um, but the streets were narrowed before we had these street type typologies yeah. um, and they were narrowed for water um, stormwater reasons. There was too much stormwater runoff. So they tried to reduce it. Um, whether that was, you know, <laughs> had an unintended, <laughs> that's, that's basically how we got to where we are. And now the question is, what do we do to try to match our street types? Cause the expectation is you want to have this right street type for every street so that it's safe right. for everybody to drive, safe for everybody to walk and safe for everybody to bike. And that's, that's right. the key to our complete streets plan, which the city council has adopted. Okay, thank you for that. That, that, that clarifies that part. Uh, in a later section, 3504, apparently an expert of some sort said that uh, at peak, there would be an additional 60 trips up and down these streets. Um, and because Isabel Circle and Hebert are considered class three roads, he said that a maximum of 50 additional trips uh, at, at peak morning and evening would be the maximum. Uh, am I reading that wrong? It seems like we're at least 10 and quite possibly a lot more trips over what he recommends for a class three road. Um, um, does that have any impact on the approval of, of this whole project? So the, the, the 60 <laughs> trip estimate, right? That's not based on a traffic study. That no. was information no. from um, um, Jeff, the, the consultant that's on here with the applicant right. that I think is pulled from just some base tabular data that is out there right now. I can't think of the name of it. That's correct. The, uh, ITE, Institute of Traffic Engineers, um, they use different land use codes. So this land use code would be a residential, um, residential complex. So it's just a based on, you know, even even if you know, you know, it's not doesn't necessarily have to be development specific because you know pe er, people are individuals; they do things at different times. But very consistently, if you have a, they found if you have a fifty-seven unit um, development, uh, it will generate in the morning, and the the, the ratios are slightly different. Um, mm -hmm. It might round to the same one, but in the morning and evening, um, during the peak hour, uh, fifty-seven cars will pass by. So okay. you know, everybody can do the math, right? That's that's one a minute um, additional. So, you know, think in your head, you know, car passes by. Wait a minute. Another car is going to pass by. So that happens in, in the morning and the evening. Okay. As, as Paul Burns said before, though, and he used the same words I'm going to use, um, and I'm going to quote here, it's up to the developer to demonstrate no adverse effect upon traffic and traffic will not be substantially greater. This is substantially greater if one car a minute is going to go by. It, um, that just doesn't happen now. This is a this is a substantial increase in traffic by by any stretch of the imagination. And possibly the sixty trips morning and night are an undercount if you have a hundred cars in this development. But you know that's up to debate. I guess you have the numbers. Um, I think the, the terms Paul used were right from the proposal. Um, substantially greater traffic and adverse effects. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, later in this same section, uh, it references two access points for a typical development like this. And it says that the board may waive this requirement if it's impractical. Again, I'd ask what the meaning of impractical is uh, and who determines that. I assume it would be the board but uh, what are the criteria for determining that uh, it's impractical to investigate or build another access point to this development? And why would the board waive that? Um, and I assume that has nothing to do with the price of constructing a road, which would be very pricey to do. That's not the board's, uh, that's not the board's purview to worry about what it costs to create the other access point, I don't think. Um, and finally, uh, there was a section dealing with compatibility 
with the existing neighborhood. And I'm not going to get into that because that's a real can of worms. But in the staff comment after that section, it said, and I quote, the board should keep in mind a history of subdivision development in this neighborhood. And I'm not sure what that refers to. Um, and maybe Meredith could uh, address that. Uh, well, what, his, what history is being referred to there? <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm kind of lost what you're talking about, but- I know, I, know. I didn't uh, write down the citation on it. I'm, I'm, um, I'm puzzling uh, you. Yeah, so um, I think that might have been in relation to com like what else is going on with the neighborhood, that there are multiple developments in the neighborhood, either that happened or that were proposed, that it's it's a, a it's sort of a planned neighborhood of residential groupings, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I meant by the compatibility. Um, okay. It doesn't tie into necessarily specifically traffic things like that. Right, right. But you know, we're not talking about starting um, a, a proposal that is a mix of uses with subdivision and you know with, with residential mm -hmm. and commercial right, right. all mixed in in the midst of a grouping of small residential neighborhoods. Right. That's right. where I think that's where I was getting at with that. Okay. That keeping in mind okay. what's happened here before. Okay. I was I was just I thought I was puzzled by the word history there. Um, I can give you one piece of history for the board's edification here. When this proposal was last brought to the attention of the city in 2007, a, a big development was proposed for this parcel back there. I think some entity in the city, perhaps the DRB, finally decided that there should not be access from Isabel Circle, that they were going to require the developer to build a road up from down below. And at the end of Isabel Circle, there would be a high curb constructed so that only emergency vehicles could get over it and re regular cars could not get over it. And that was a compromise to allow access for emergency vehicles to that proposed development. I don't know whether the board considers this a precedent or not, but I certainly would think that they should take this into consideration that a previous board, that was their solution to this same question of access from Isabel Circle. And granted, it was a much bigger development at that point as the, the current developers pointed out. Um, but again, is the cost of something a factor which the board has to consider? I, I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's let's keep going. See Barbara. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm Barbara Thompson. I live at 35 Hebert Road, Unit Two, in the Stonewall Meadows Condominium Association. Um, this has been a really interesting discussion and I thank everyone for participating. Uh, it's brought up a lot of things. I, I share the interest in the concern about Hebert Road as a dangerous road. It has no lane markings and people use it as a one lane road. I also share very much the concern about uh, stormwater uh, and drainage issues and the storm. I wanted to ask the question about this, the stormwater retention areas in the plan of the developers. There were three um, areas that were mentioned and I wanted to know a little bit more about what those would be. I'm concerned about the, the neighbor on Kaplan Street who's had a lot of water problems and then the, the, the neighbor at this meeting tonight who talked about her drainage problems. Because I see um, from our condo association, which is part probably of the history of development, um, subdivision development in this neighborhood, uh, many issues which I'm concerned about. And perhaps I have a unique point of view as a condominium owner. When I looked at that plan tonight of the cottage developments, 
I, my first question was, who's going to manage this? Who's going to uh, plow those sidewalks? Who's going to landscape those common areas? How are people going to agree on that? Because I live in a 12 unit condominium and it's very difficult and very expensive on our area, on our sloping areas to maintain this. And we 12 homeowners spend a lot of money maintaining it. We have supposedly municipal water and sewage but we have a very expensive pump system that we have to pump our sewage water up to meet the city water, uh, excuse me, the city sewage um, drainage. And this has put additional costs on our homeowner association. When I look at the plan for this cottage uh, development, there is no way I would buy one of those. How are you gonna have people walking in the middle of winter along those sidewalks with no car access? It's just totally impractical for Vermont winters. And that's all I have to say about that. And uh, I'm sorry because I, I like the idea of the cottage clusters, but I don't think it's practical for our winter situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, next I see Ivan. Thank you board members for providing the opportunity for us to comment tonight. I am remotely participating in this, in this meeting and I'm here tonight to comment on the design identified as for the Isabel Circle in Stonewall Meadows. I'll be brief. The infrastructure that we have, the right of way, public right of way infrastructure that we have is not capable of servicing this design. Our as built neighborhood right now has 49 single family homes. 12 condominium units and 10 apartments. That makes a total of 71 dwelling units in the neighborhood. This application has approximately 54 additional dwelling units to be added to the neighborhood. That's an increase of 76% to the number of dwelling units that are to be served by the intersection of Hebert Road in Berlin Street, which is an unsignaled intersection. It has a bent T geometry and the percent slope on Hebert Road near that intersection is as high as 16% to 19%. And those aren't numbers that I obtained just by eyeballing it. That's uh, from open source state one foot contour data. And if you add snow and ice to this geometry, which is way less than ideal already, it makes it even less than ideal uh, for traversing through that intersection there. And otherwise, uh, the, the prior comments uh, captured what it, um, prior comments uh, captured uh, the other points I had to say. Again, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we just so um, Julie Griffin. You're next. Hi, um, I'm Julie Giffen. I live at 222 Berlin Street, so a little bit outside of your guys' neighborhood. But I kind of want to jump in on the traffic bandwagon here. Um, we've, my family's lived on, in this house since, uh, 1967, which means that we predate Stonewall Meadows, Isabel Circle, Shaw's, the mall, car dealerships. And I can say that the trap, the biggest negative impact in quality of life over the past 50 years has been the amount of traffic that we have, um, going up and down Berlin street. Like we can't, you know, I mean, I understand that my situation is very different from yours. 
Um, but I would say that if you have bought places on Isabel Circle hoping for a quiet neighborhood, doubling the traffic will be a negative impact on you, I would think. And I also think that Berlin Street has um, kind of gotten tapped out with how much traffic pressure it can have and handle um, with school buses, car, you know, delivery, you know, delivery stuff, um, residents. And I love the idea of affordable housing. Um, but I do think that if uh, there could be a, you know, like a, almost like a pressure valve release with the um, access point being to the very Montpelier Road, that would be super helpful and, and not and, and a single access point um, if that's even possible. But I think that, you know, kind of having the, the quiet neighborhood um, that you guys have now, I would think you would want to preserve it's it's pretty impactful to have cars going by all the time. And that's my big, that would be my biggest concern from my perspective, adding a hundred more cars potentially per day, twice a day. Um, and I can only imagine what it would do to you guys, but that's my, my input. And I, this has been pretty informative meeting actually. So I thank you for having it. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Maury Lynch. Thank you. Um, thank you again for the board and uh, developers for the presentation. And uh, I pretty much would just reiterate what uh, George and Paul and Ivan and Julie and most of us have mentioned with the traffic. Uh, oh, and for the record, that's Six Hebert Road, um, which is right on the bend uh, coming into the neighborhood. So after you go down the steep slope, you come right around the bend and my property is right there. So yes, the, the additional traffic would be quite a concern. Um, you know, it, it was mentioned during the board section about uh, emergency response for, um, for the particular development itself, but the other concern would be emergency response into the development with all of those, those additional cars and, um, you know, both in inclement weather and, you know, it was about six or seven years ago, there was a telephone pole that came across, came down across the, the road and power was out and there was no access to this entire neighborhood for four or five hours, six hours. So, um, yeah, just again, reiterating what's already been said and, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Maury. And last I see, is it Peter Kelman? Uh, I'm Peter Kelman. Um, I live, uh, in district three on, in the other major access area on Northfield street. Um, but I, I live in. Um, Mountain View uh, Street, um, I, I, and I'm I'm going to address here not so much the DRB, but uh, address uh, Mike Miller, uh, Planning and Zoning, uh, the Public Works people, and Bill Fraser. I think it's very clear from listening to all the comments here that many people have described uh, a situation that is already difficult in terms of traffic and the street safety and uh, erosion and so forth. This is going to be true for all developments that are proposed in Montpelier, whether it's the uh, 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 this project or Habitat for Humanity or the um, the uh, Elks Club or the proposed or the possibility of having something at the corner of Northfield Street and, and our neighborhood. And I think that the city has a great opportunity. And I think Mike Miller actually uh, uh, identify this. The city has a great opportunity to support development by making an investment in infrastructure that will not only make possible the new development, but make the older uh, neighborhoods safer, better serviced, et cetera. And, you know, uh, uh, Bill uh, Frazier often talks, says, well, we don't do development. Developers do that. Yes, that's true. But what the city can do 
And public works has got to play a big role in this as well as planning and zoning. What the, what the city can do is to make the infrastructure investments that will make the overall city uh, a, a more livable. If we have traffic fl flowing down Northfield Street, traffic flowing down Berlin Street, this is going to cause incredible traffic problems where we already have traffic problems at the intersection of Northfield and, 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 uh, and, and, and River Street. So the city has got to do some planning about this. I'm very much in favor of this project. I'm very much in favor of all those projects. But the city's got to step up, I think, and, 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 and support the projects with the proper infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay, I don't see any additional new uh, hands raised. Uh, Meredith, am I missing anything? Well, I think Barbara had actually put her hand down and then put it back up. Julie's is still up and Peter's is still up. Theirs didn't go away, but I think Barbara's actually went back up. Is that right, Barbara? That's correct. I just wanted to uh, affirm what Peter just said. I believe what I've heard from this discussion tonight is that the city needs to take more responsibility for building up the infrastructure that will support these kind of development projects. And I also wanted just to reaffirm uh, about the access. We had a tree down on uh, at the beginning of Berlin Street and Hebert Road one uh, last year sometime, and we were not able to have access to this whole neighborhood for half a day. So it, that wasn't a problem that day, but in terms of having more climate uh, emergencies, more, you know, we need another access point to this neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to wrap up the public comment period now and I just want to thank everybody for for turning out tonight and for for sharing your thoughts and asking your questions. Um, applicant, I'd, I'd love to give you a couple of minutes um, in close or response or anything that you'd like to say uh, before we wrap tonight. I just say I just thank everyone who participated tonight. Really good feedback. We we the more information we have, the better we can you know produce something that people are going to be. We're never going to satisfy everyone. We know, but. Uh, the, the, certainly safety is a number one concern of all of us and uh, a priority for however we might move forward. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Uh, we are coming to the close of our meeting and going back to the agenda. So other, other business, uh, we have next meeting scheduled for July 18th. Is that correct, Meredith? Yep. Yep, everybody gets a July 4th holiday, including me. Oh, good. <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, with that, I think I'll I'll take a motion to adjourn. I would make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Catherine. All right. So Sharon, how do you vote? Yay. Catherine? Yay. Michael? Yes. Jean? Oh, I think we lost Jean. Okay, and I vote yes. <laughs> so with that, we are adjourned. Thank we you, everyone. Adjourned.